Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for coming to the fourth and last session of Women Get the Vote. And I will now turn it over to Joe Brito. Hello, everybody. Hello. Uh, Hello. This is our last session. And as par for the course, I'm gonna go flying past a lot of these things, but hopefully um, we will get the gist of uh, this monumental uh, period with, with a very, very significant um, result, which we'll talk about. Um, we already asked if there's any questions, so I'm gonna move right ahead to this thing. Um, we start with Jane Adams. So, <clears throat> Over the three sessions we've been talking about, we talked about basically and very generally, and, and, and all of these subjects can be talked about at even greater length than we have in, this, in these four sessions, but this is just meant to kind of whet your appetite, maybe for some other things, reading, movies, etc. Uh, but as, as you, probably more than me, are aware uh, of how women have been treated in history um, from the very, very beginning, um, from, the, from the beginnings of our country, to be sure. Um, traditions that have come over to us from Europe, for the most part, uh, and carried on in this country. And women always had this second class, third class uh, status. Politically, in terms of the vote, which is what we're talking about specifically, but also in very, very many other areas. Women of color, um, immigrant women, um, certain religious groups uh, of women, um, also treated in this country very, very badly. And we will mention some of those things as we go along. So we've been talking about it now for three weeks talking about certain people in particular for three weeks. We're going to continue in that vein. And please interrupt, ask questions, say what, uh, if there's something that you need to say. Jane Addams, uh, another one of these people. So before I even start talking about Jane Addams and these people, we're, go we're getting to the late 1900s, 1918, 1919, 1920s. And this has been called by historians the progressive era, the progressive age in American history. Uh, we will find out certainly why it was called the progressive age. But one of these things is the, and this overrides everything that we're gonna be talking about, the increasing participation of women uh, in areas that they always were kept out of. Um, and some by their own choice, and, and, and mostly because other people kept them out of it. And we're talking about the workforce, uh, we're talking about um, being able to, if not vote yet, at least um, be able to really have some effect on politicians, on people who are voting, uh, to have uh, in varying degrees, and we'll, we're gonna talk about this too, varying degrees have very much of an effect on what Congress people and senators and other people did. So we'll talk about that. Jane Addams was very, very much involved in children's rights, in, in women's rights on a very um, fundamental and functionary level. And a uh, giant, if we can say, among, among certain women, uh, the women that we're talking about. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about her even a little bit later. Yeah. <clears throat> Hello. Hello. And these are, of course, these are photographs. Hello. These aren't paintings. These are photographs. Of these <clears throat> Bed. Hey. Hello. Hello. We have a little oh, God. No, no, sorry. Oh, no. no, it's the beginning. It's the beginning. I gotta go all the way down, ladies. Sorry. <clears throat> it's very. Uh, depressing, but the fact that in, in this movement, in most of what we're going to be talking about in terms of the history of this time, racism was still very, very prevalent in the United States. Now, I'm not talking about just racism uh, between black and white people, but um, immigrants that were coming over in, in increasing numbers uh, in the 19... 
well, the 1880s, 90s, 1900s, etc. <coughs> there was an influx in the United States of uh, Italians, uh, Jews from Eastern Europe, Central and Eastern Europe, um, Roman Catholic people and Jewish people that were very, very much put upon by the predominantly Protestant uh, population in the United States. A real anti-Catholic um, feeling in, during this time period, going into the 1940s, 1950s, and the same with anti-Semitism in this country uh, during that time. So that complicated uh, these roles, especially for women who had who had a second or third class position to begin with. So again, as we said uh, last time, or the, the second or the third session, there's a lot of internal conflict that's going on. We talked about some of the conflicts between those who were trying um, to get uh, slavery abolished and then finally to get black men, um, black men first to be able to vote. And then the women's movement, of course, saying, well, no, we have to get black women, we have to get all women to vote. Uh, but even within the women's movement, there was a lot of racism. There was a lot of prejudice. There were a lot of organizations, for example, that never invited black women um, in, any, in any degree. And so black women had to form their own societies, which they did. All aiming towards the same goal, but sometimes uh, in a parallel way, not together, but in a parallel way. So that, of course, is going on, too. The President uh, of the United States at the time, 1897 to 1901, was William McKinley. Um, as far as things uh, went, a uh, relatively successful president, not the most, not the least, uh, but not very, very much involved or interested in women's rights, particularly, and of course, uh, we know what happened to McKinley, right? He gets uh, assassinated. What? Yeah. Um, William Jennings Bryan had run against him. Um, and you'll see this trend, too, among some of the men in the different political parties. A little bit more attuned to women's rights <clears throat> at the time, but not, not greatly so. Uh, the Democratic Party, not particularly greatly so. It's... it's um, it's interesting that later on, and we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more later on, more radical parties begin to become much more um, attractive to a lot of women leaders. But black women, African American women, pretty much remain Republican through the whole time. Why? Why such a devout adherence to the Republican Party? Lincoln. Lincoln. Bingo. Abraham Lincoln, Lincoln's party, and so they kept with the Republicans for a very long time. Okay. Ida B. Wells, a black uh, suffragette, and that's another thing. We use these terms, suffragette, and so they go to change as we go along. You'll see that how it gets more radical and also broader. We're talking about the vote. We're talking about the franchise, as they used to call the vote. But we'll see by the time we get to 1910, 1915, et cetera, et cetera, that this idea is being expanded not only for the vote, but for women's rights um, in terms of their sexual, um, their sexuality, women's rights in terms of work, women's rights in terms of being able to go to college or to go to graduate school even. Uh, we'll see how this expands as we go along. But Ida Wells was a very, one of the most significant African-American uh, women at the time for many groups. Remember I told you that uh, black women had to kind of form their own organizations, their own colleges, their own uh, um, places to be able to get the things they couldn't get any other way. Ida B. Wells was one of those women. Uh, he's not, now, <clears throat> before we talk about some of these, I know that I'm throwing like hundreds of, you know, maybe not hundreds, but dozens of women's names at you. Some of them are very, very um, famous, and you've heard them before. Some of them maybe not so. I would suggest that either by looking on your phone or something like that, you look up some of these people and just see who they were. They're very, very interesting people. Um, 
Francis Willig was particularly uh, interested in education in children's education um, in trying to get some recognition for women uh, not only ultimately politically but in terms of their work and worked along those lines for that. Uh, Mary Elizabeth Lease, you see here it says author, and I don't know if you can see all this, author and lecturer of the Western Lecture Bureau, uh, Wichita, Kansas. It's very, very interesting too. I found it particularly interesting that a lot of the more um, forward-thinking work was being done in the West, in the American West. So you think about the Northeast, you think about places like New York City and Boston and even uh, Richmond and Virginia and stuff, and you think maybe things are happening there. But there's a lot of resistance in the East um, to women's movements for a number of reasons that we'll get into later. But resistance like, for example, um, a lot of the manufacturing interests in the Northeast relied on women's labor relied on the fact that women can be able to come in cheaper, work cheaper. Uh, and so there was a lot of resistance to any kind of union activity with women, any kind of chance that women would get more recognized, get into unions themselves, etc. Whereas in the Midwest, uh, and the West, further West, uh, the idea of, for example, even the idea of women voting as most of you know, before the passage of the 19th Amendment, there are states in the West that give women the right to vote. A lot of people don't, I think, are not <coughs> cognizant of that. That even before the 19th Amendment, there are Western states that allowed women to vote. And so this becomes a more uh, modern, for want of a better term, a more forward-thinking um, uh, place. Uh, Miss Lease was one of those. She founded the Western Lecture Bureau. She spoke uh, to various crowds about women's rights on various levels. Of course, the right to vote, but on various levels. Uh, and she's another, another, I hate to use the giant in the field. They were all, they were all working towards this end. Um, Leonora O'Reilly. As it says, National Woman, Women's Trade Union leader. We're starting to get to that point where women are beginning to form their own unions. Some of the male-dominated unions are very resistant to women being members, to women having any say. Uh, Miss O'Reilly founds, uh, finds one of these uh, unions locally, a very powerful one. Now, Harriet Stanton Blatch, as you can see, she's with somebody else you know. She is Caddy Stanton's daughter. Mm. And, of course, you know, having Caddy Stanton as a mother, she is a suffragette and a suffragist. I don't know, they use both those terms interchangeably. Uh, and so she picks up where her mother leaves off. Kind of expect that. Look. With a child, for somebody like that, you're going to get one or two reactions. Either they're going to reject you completely and go do their own thing, or they're going to take up um, where you left off. And she took up where her mother left off. Yes. Yeah. Um, again, throwing you all these names. Inez Milholland. Uh, what? Is she on there? She's that one in the middle. She's the one on the horse. Right. Right, very, very active, very daring, you know, riding the horse, things like that. She was, uh, she literally carried the banner uh, for women in parts of the West and in the, and in the East, I believe. She was um, interested in um, more equality in labor, better wages, stuff like that. I have a question. Yes, ma'am? These women. Yes. These prominent women, uh -huh. were they in better financial shape than the other women that 
these women look as if they have money. How, how do they look like they have money? Just the way they're dressed, the way their hair is clothed, um, <coughs> just they just look like they might be moneyed, therefore they have an edge or a leg up on some of the other women? Well, I would say yes, yes, and yes. Um, the women's movement for the longest time particularly dominated, the, the part of it that was dominated by white women, um, was uh, led, led is a loose term, but its most prominent people were upper middle class or wealthy. Were most of them married? M most. Most of them were married. Mm. Yes. And the husband's reaction to, the, to these things is very interesting. Either they went along with it, or they ignored it, or they resisted it. Um, Caddy Stanton, as a matter of fact, had a husband who wasn't crazy about what she was doing. Now, they didn't divorce over it or stuff, but I'm sure it made for very interesting arguments uh, around the dinner table. Um, and I think she just did her thing and he did his, and they went in separate ways. They stayed together, but they went in separate ways. So the reaction to everything, and some husbands left if, if their wives were very, very active, they just left. Um, so you had the gamut of those relationships. But to answer your first question, most of them were married. Uh, Sophie Seba, I love that first name, uh, Breckenridge, was very, very active um, amongst the white population. I'm trying to think of it. I don't remember at one point if she was an Eastern or a Western. I think she was Eastern. Uh, I, don't, I think so. I believe so. Um, an, another leader uh, in, 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 in the uh, attempt in particular to get women more recognized at work. Women were working more. A lot of companies relied on women to work. Why? They didn't have to pay them as much. They were very reliable. They usually showed up all the time. Usually younger women because all the women had kids and had to watch the kids. So it usually was uh, not children, but women in their late teens, 20s, etc. Immigrant families relied on girls going to work for the family in order to sustain the family. And we'll talk about that in a very dramatic way in, in a short time. But it's okay. Margaret Haley, um, a lot of um, descendants of Irish immigrants, too. I think Margaret was one of them. And uh, she was college educated, I believe. Very unusual for the time. And spoke, and she was uh, trying to be uh, a union organizer involved in some kind of women's approach to, to union. Um, another leader at this time. Again, I hate to keep on telling you all these names. Mary Kenny O'Sullivan, obviously of Irish immigrant uh, family. Um, also particularly active in, uh, in health in terms of the women's movement. Um, and another leader during this time. Uh, the Dreyer sisters, two sisters. You had you had this happening very often too, where family members, um, again, daughters of these women who were leaders, very often. I think most, ninety percent of them would take up where their mother had had started and or left off and carried on uh, what they were doing. Uh, the Dreyer sisters were very, very active, uh, I believe, in school in trying to get women more educated, formally educated. Um, graduate school was particularly uh, rare for women at this time, particularly in the law and medicine, those two places. The law in particular used to push back against women. For any of you who, uh, who read like about uh, RBG, RBG, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and people like that. 
Uh, she was what one of only four women in the whole Harvard law class, uh, and they had to be exceptional to be able to get uh, and admit, admitted. And that was in the fifties. That was as late as the fifties. So here in the we're talking about from the 1890s to the 19, to when the amendment, excuse me, is passed to the 1920s. We call it the Progressive Era in American history. And it's called the Progressive Era for a reason, not only because of the women's vote, uh, but because there's progressive uh, attitudes by men and women uh, in the United States all during this period of time in very many different ways. Um, Clara Lemlick. Uh, Clara Lemlick was uh, an interesting woman. She was uh, also self-taught. She was able to go to college. Um, I think that she was very, very much involved in um, the movement towards housing. Um, tenement housing was introduced in particularly the the more populous cities. The whole raison d'etre of, of that kind of housing, the tenement, was to actually get immigrants more involved in American society. It backfired somewhat because the conditions became so bad uh, in the tenement houses. And some of you, I don't know if any of you have gone, there's a tenement museum in Manhattan, if you've gone there, or seen some of what the tenement houses look like. And, uh, but it, it, like I say, it backfired. She was more interested in, in better, more equal housing for people. Okay, so <clears throat> this is something that's near and dear to, to my heart in particular because my mother was a, a seamstress and worked in the city in shirt weight waist, which apparently means a blouse, blouses. Mm -hmm. Most of the people who worked uh, in the shirt waist industry were immigrant women, mostly Jewish and Italian, as it, as it would turn out. But my mother used to tell me that where she worked in the dress shop, you can hear eight or nine languages, uh, you know, people talking to each other, answering in eight or nine languages. Where did you, oh, thank you. You got off. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, I do that, I walk around, I'm sorry. Maybe you can try I that. beg your pardon. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, in the early part of the 20th century, thank you, thank you, dear. In the early part of the 20th century, there was uh, a shirtwaist factory in New York City that employed many of these immigrant women, a lot of them younger, very young women, with policies that were terrible in terms of working conditions which was true in a lot of different places. But in this factory in particular, they would lock the doors uh, from the outside when women came in so they couldn't leave, they couldn't, you know, fool around, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there were no precautions about fire, et cetera. And what happens is that the place gets on fire and something like 140, I'm sorry? 141 men and girls. 141 men and girls die in the fire. Now it was mostly girls, um, and there was a big <clears throat> bruja about this. But going ahead of the story, nothing ever happens. Nobody's ever held responsible. There's no reparations paid. Uh, it was this tragedy that just occurred. What year was that? 1911. 1911. Who owned the building? Ah, um, I don't remember who owned the building. It wasn't. It wasn't the company that owned. You know that that it wasn't the company that they worked for. The sweatshop was. The sweatshop. Yeah. I don't remember. I can find that out. Anyway. Okay. Okay. Uh, Rose Schneiderman. Uh, was a um, worker <laughs> was a worker um, in the garment industry and she became a uh, very significant very fiery spokesperson uh, 
for unions and to get better wages, um, to get uh, to get better conditions uh, in the factories, etc. And she began to speak um, about the subject more and more. Elizabeth Gurley. Flynn, as it says, woman is orator for the IWW. The IWW was a uh, union, International Workers of the World. This is the radical um, group that they joined because the regular um, working organizations just wouldn't take women or they wouldn't fight for women's rights, etc. The problem with this at the time so we're talking about 1911 to 1915 or so. So two big things, or three big things are about to happen. A, World War I. Two, the, the Russian or the Communist Revolution. Three, the Mexican Revolution in 1910. Why is that a big deal? Because with the Mexican Revolution, there is an onslaught of Mexicans moving to the United States, escaping from the horrors of the Mexican Revolution. We don't talk much about this in U.S. history, yeah. but the Mexican Revolution was devastating. A lot of people died. Uh, it was a revolution where very modern weapons, for example, were used first time, planes, bombing situations, and a lot of people died. And so a lot of folks ran to the U.S. because it was, it was impossible to live in Mexico. That Mexican influx is going to add to Mexican women in the United States, Mexican women working in areas, uh, the whole idea of stealing jobs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, not involved, not involved in the push for voting because they just, they just got here. They, could, they were barely able to live here, rather vote, but it added to all this uh, tension very significant in the in the progressive era. Um, so Is she's Helen, Helen Gurley Brown a child of Elizabeth Gurley Flynn? <clears throat> no. Not related at no. all? Huh. Interesting. Very interesting middle name, I guess it was popular at the time. Uh, Jane Addams is uh, very, very famous, as you know. Jane Addams was particularly involved in um, improvement for in the insane, for the mentally ill. Um, another, another reform that was going on during the age of reform, like 20, 30 years before, and it carried over into the 20th century. Um, and she was also instrumental in trying to fix what was going on with the tenement system. Uh, in some of the bigger cities. Jane Addams is uh, another pretty big name in terms of women's rights. Mary Ritter Beard, as you see here, I, this is her famous quote. Um, action without study is fatal. Study without action is futile. Um, Mary Ritter Beard, college educated, uh, working towards a, a better stance for women, not only in the work world, uh, but politically, all of, all of these women who were very interested in getting better rights for women, some people would say, well, what's that got to do with um, the 19th Amendment? And, and, and the point, I think, is that like other movements in history, all of this is related, all of it is heading, maybe the emphasis was not the vote for, these, for some of these leaders. Maybe the emphasis was better education, better conditions for children, uh, for the insane, et cetera, et cetera. But it was definitely to enhance women's position outside of the home, outside of just being a mother and a wife, or being, I shouldn't say just being a mother and a wife, but being a mother and a wife <coughs> and being uh, very much involved in these other areas. And so that's why I think it's all relevant. Yes. Florence Kelly, um, and says there's a speech on child labor in America. Um, in the early 1920s, I, I believe, children 
um, and work was finally made illegal. <coughs> However, there were ways to get around it. Besides that, it was fundamental, um, just like I said before, that women young girls being able to work in immigrant families was very important so were children being able to work because it eased uh the conditions for the family now these these people are living in these tenements you know the expression throwing the baby out with the bathwater." Mm -hmm. you know where that comes from yes mm -hmm. we talked about it this week we did yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. It's one of your favorite things, I know. I know. It's, it's one of my favorite things. I'm sorry to repeat myself. <laughs> but that kind, of, that kind of stuff. These were terrible, terrible conditions. And people like Florence Kelly um, were very, very much focused on that. Again, focused on child labor. A suffragette? Technically, maybe not. But definitely with the aim, with the overarching aim, that women should be recognized. That women should have a place... Uh, in regular society, and so in that sense, definitely contributing uh, to to the whole process. Uh, and even uh, and women, even because um, we said there's all these there's all these um, struggles between white women, African American women, Asian women, Native American women, but there were women's organizations, particularly in the West. Uh, that were doing very positive things in terms of their Native American sisters. Uh, this was a woman's group that had, had structured this monument uh, to Sacagawea. Of course, you know, you know who Jack Sacagawea was? She's the Native American woman that led yeah. Lewis and Clark yeah. Yeah. on their expedition. She really helped. They were, law, they were literally in the woods, and she came and she led them. To, to their destination. So that kind of monument in Oregon. Um, and then we get to the presidential election in 1912. Very, very significant presidential election. And these are the candidates. Woodrow Wilson for the Democratic Party. Theodore Roosevelt. Now, the Republican candidate was William Taft. Teddy Roosevelt, T.R., really thought that he would be the candidate. He was not. He formed his own party, uh, a progressive party, the progressive party, also called the Bull Moose Party. And he decided to run anyway. And then the socialist, Eugene Debs. Um, it's 1912. The Russian Revolution has not, has not occurred yet. <clears throat> Socialism is around. People know about it. People fear it, uh, in the United States in particular. Uh, but he was an American socialist, really a giant political figure in American history. People, well, I had a socialist candidate here. He ran like seven times for president or whatever. But a major, major figure in American political history. So you had these four very, very strong contenders. What happens is... The Republicans and the Progressive Party take votes from each other. He gets, he, the Socialists do the best they've ever done in American history in this election. The best they've ever done. And who wins? Woodrow Wilson. Because these guys divide all the votes and he wins. <coughs> Woodrow Wilson was uh, a Democrat. He was a Southerner. Um, he was mildly interested in women's right to vote, the suffrage, but he wasn't a particular backer of women's suffrage. Uh, but everything that's been, that's been happening up to this time that we've been talking about is about to hit him in the face, uh, almost literally. Um, so he becomes president. Huh? Do you know how it goes there? I'm sorry. Do you know what the other looks like? Who? Did you want me to go back? To Woodrow Wilson? Yeah. No. Just good. Kay Richards O'Hare is one of those uh, women who at the time uh, is, has decided. Now, the women's movement has gone to trying to get a national program. That wasn't working very well. They tried to get states to react. That worked a little bit, as, as you recall. 
It was in the West of the United States where women actually got the right to vote first before there was a national, before there was an amendment. Women were allowed to vote in some Western states. They were very successful. By the time they got to this period, um, and right about this election, when Woodrow Wilson became president, uh, most women leaders decided, and, and, and uh, Kay O'Hare was one of the leaders of that, decided that we have to get back and get a national policy for the vote. That we can't do this thing where you can vote in one state but not in another. We need a national policy. We need an amendment to the Constitution. So, once again, the women's movement shifts gears. And she's a, a leader of that. Okay. Rose Pastor Stokes, a uh, black woman uh, who is working in, um, I believe, the East. She's not in the South. Uh, trying to get, garner some kind of uh, support for black women from the majority uh, women's movement. She's, the success is mixed. Not to beat us over the head about this issue, but America <clears throat> was a very racist society at this time. Uh, and this was always an issue. The South was, of course, worse because of Jim Crow laws. Now, Jim Crow, uh, the origin of Jim Crow, anybody know that? The origin of where that comes from? Where the name comes from? I used to know. <laughs> Jim Crow uh, was a minstrel character. Now, minstrelsy uh, was uh, an incredible, incredibly racist activity to begin with. And of course, minstrelsy is white people being, uh, looking like black people, wearing black face, and acting like clowns and, and uh, idiots. The black people were the clowns and the idiots, and he, Jim Crow, was a character in those minstrel productions. And Jim Crow laws essentially were uh, the South's uh, attempt, or people in the South's attempt, to undo what the Civil War and the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment did, making, uh, making Af African American men uh, citizens and giving them the vote, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so um, she was, she tried to act, it was tough for a, a woman of color to be able to do that, but she worked in that vein. The first picket line, okay. So now, the whole, and, and notice how the movement, the women's movement, changes gears as uh, the history, as, as, as the, the, the political scene, the social scene around them changes. Notice how they have to try to change with uh, what's going on in history. And what they're doing is they're becoming much, much more uh, militant terms of what they're going to do. And they decide what they have to do is they have to directly picket the White House. They have to, they have to directly picket the president and make this condition known to him. Um, so, as you see the sign, Mr. President, how long must women wait for liberty? Mr. President, what will you do for women's suffrage? I mean, this is not, we're not, this is not vague anymore. This is in your face. We're making this comment. Uh, and here we go. Voters out west. Uh, why deny our rights in the east? Right? Because the west, again, the west became the more progressive area, interestingly enough. It was in the west where, where some states where women had the right to vote already. Uh, and they were like, well, what's, you know, what's taking, what's taking so long? And this is when, again, they shifted gears. They said, no, we need a national policy. Um, but there was the other side, too. Uh, the headquarters for the association opposed to women's suffrage. And there, you see men, but there's this one woman, and there were a lot of women who were opposed to suffrage. Mm -hmm. Absolutely opposed to suffrage. Now, we're not going to have time to do this, but I wanted to go ahead and talk about the Equal Rights Amendment. Remember the Equal Rights Amendment? Mm -hmm. Now, that was defeated essentially because women defeated it. 
other women voted against them. So, you know, it, it, there's, there's two there's two very strong opinions about this. Okay. Uh, again, again, more picket signs. Wilson against women, so they started to hammer him with, you must be against women if you're not doing anything about this. But then, in the meantime, you can go to the next one. Uh, okay. This doesn't happen often. We talked about uh, a black woman, if you remember, who went, went during the Western expansion, went out west, founded a hotel. Remember her? She founded a hotel, and she, uh, she became a very, very wealthy woman. Very rare that African-American women would be able to do this. This was another lady. Uh, her real name was Sarah Breedlove, but she became Madam C.J. Walker. She became a, an entrepreneur, and I believe a millionaire. Her home is in Westchester County. Oh, yes? Yeah. It's beautiful. I think she did hair care products. She did hair yeah, care products, right. Yeah, that was her thing. Ended up being, yeah, near Tallytown, New York. Was like oh, yeah. Her, her mansion. Yes. Her yes. Have you been there? I've been past it, not uh -huh. in it. Uh -huh. yeah. Well, it that's her. Incredible. Yeah. Yes. And, uh, and it is. It was just an incredible story yeah. that she was able to become this wealthy woman. Uh, Mary Church... Terrell, um, another uh, African-American woman who uh, became somewhat of a leader, um, not somewhat, became a leader in terms of the movement. Um, again, black women, don't see many Latin women, but black women, white women uh, coming, not together, but parallel lines towards the same end. Uh, Gertrude Simmons Bonin was a, a Native American woman Zitkala Sa actually was her Native American name. I believe Sioux name. She was from the Sioux tribe. Um, and she was another leader. Again, you see these women of color, Native American women, parallel lines towards the same end. They're not really working together. They're not always fighting with each other, but they find, especially with African American women, they have to find their own organizations, their own path uh, to be able to do this. Because as we know, just getting ahead of the story, after the amendment that gives women the vote, African American women have to wait till almost the 60s and 70s before they're really allowed to vote. Carrie Chapman Catt, another particular leader in this new, more uh, aggressive wave uh, of, of women leaders. Just talking about. Um, and uh, we come now to a very, very interesting point. So this is going on in the United States, been going on in the United States for a long time. However, in England, in Great Britain, there is a very, very significant movement for women's rights. As a matter of fact, one of the earliest uh, countries that gives women the vote is Australia. At the time, part of the British Empire. And Australia, I believe, gives women the vote before the United States does. Um, the women's movement in Great Britain is very much more aggressive than in the United States for the longest time. And that's due in, in part to a couple of leaders, but the most prominent, absolutely, without a doubt, most prominent woman leader in suffrage in Great Britain is uh, Emmeline Pankhurst. She and her two daughters, um, she, this is a picture of her with her daughters, um, Christabel and Sylvia, uh, were instrumental uh, in terms of getting the vote eventually in Great Britain. And American leaders visiting Britain were able to bring that back. Uh, and really, that's what begins this very aggressive push uh, towards getting the vote. And then the next one, I think, is the American woman who goes to England. Yes, Alice Paul uh, is one of those very, very significant. You know, we talk about Caddy Stanton and them, and they're the originals, right? They're definitely the originals. But these women, uh, uh, Alice Paul and, 
Lucy. Sorry? Lucy. Um, We're going to see her next. Okay. Are, are really very, very significant later leaders uh, of the movement. Alice Paul brings very aggressive, very much more modern ideas, has visited the Pankhursts, worked with them for a short time, brought all those ideas back to the United States. And so the movement becomes even more significant. Lucy Burns. Lucy Burns is the other one. Um, what happens is they become leaders of the of women's um, organizations. Their emphasis is much more um, spot on. Um, they're much more aggressive about what they want to do about the boat. And these become the new leaders of the movement. That's it. No. Jen Rankin. Um, somebody who comes along at this time who's very, very um, serious about this, and she's one of the first women that's elected to Congress. Now, Jeanette Rankin has the, uh, I was going to say dubious distinction, but it may not be dubious, of voting against World War I. And I think World War I and World War II, we're not sure about that. She was probably too young for World War I. World War II. Even after Pearl Harbor, when the United States, everybody was in favor of the war. She voted, she's the only person in Congress who voted against the war because she just thought war was wrong. There's gotta be a better way to do this. But her claim to fame, of course, was that she was elected to Congress. She was from Montana, right? One of the Western. She was from Montana, what? One of the Western, went Montana with that? Montana, mission? one of the Western states. She's very significant. And Emma Goldman is another lady later uh, in, in time who is right up to the point where the, where the amendment is passed and she's really pushing for, for these programs. And then, hoo-ha, uh, <laughs> they get the vote. Now, it seems anticlimactic they get the vote. The, the fact of the matter is, and I want to emphasize this because a lot of women leaders emphasize this too, women were not given the vote. Women fought for the vote. And I, I'm not doing that to get on my wife's good side or your good side, it's absolutely the truth. Women fought for uh, over many years, I mean we talk about from the 40s to the 1840s to the present, uh, but it probably went on much longer than that. Women fought for the vote until they got it. Uh, and this was the, this was finally the result. And it was in all the newspapers, all, the, all over the country. Uh, and then finally, I think this is the last one. No. These, and they celebrate. You know, they're allowed to have a party to celebrate all this stuff. Um, and that's it. So, that's it, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I hope it was enjoyable. Any questions, comments, observations? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>